Welcome. Welcome to Take Stock Live, our investor webinar series where we've been coming to you live every Wednesday, 15 minutes after market close. We're now into the penultimate show of the second season. Uh, final episode is next Wednesday, October 28th. And I'll tell you what's coming up uh, next week. Uh, we're co-hosting the show again with Sterling Merchant Capital, a great supporter of the investor series. Uh, we're going to be bringing you Integra Resources and Forbidden Spirits and might have one other surprise for you. So come back next Wednesday. Uh, we would like to thank the TMX Group and TSX Venture Exchange, our event partner, for helping us keep the conversation between companies and investors going in these very unusual times. We'd also like to recognize the vital support provided by our core sponsors, Faskin, MNP, Lee Jones Gable, Olympia Trust, and the CSE, who helped us launch Take Stock Investor Forum back in 2014. Thank you also to our supporters, to our extended network, uh, for helping us uh, make this happen. Thank you to Calgary Meg and CIM, to the Manitoba and Saskatchewan prospectors and developers, to CHF Capital, to Conduit Capital, and to many others. Particular thanks to Investment Pitch Media and the Newswire for helping us get the word out. At this point, I would hand the mic over to my colleague, Mark Francis. Thank you, Raj, and welcome all of you, our attendees and guest presenters. Note our disclaimer, this presentation is for information only and is not a solicitation to buy or sell stock. Companies pay fees to present a take stock and take stock in its principles. Raj Joshi and Mark Francis may have equity investments in companies we invite to present, may consult to the companies and make no representation or investment or other recommendation in regards to these presenting or any other companies. You should do due diligence and seek professional investment advice. Some housekeeping matters for attendees. You will note a red reconnect tab at the top of your screen if you lose audio. Just click it and you will be reconnected. Normally we run about 45 minutes uh, and uh, the chat board will be made available in this session in particular for questions, uh, geological and technically minded questions in particular. Please be clear as to whom your question is being addressed and use the chat board for serious investor and technical questions. Today we have three mining companies. Each company will have a presentation with their PowerPoint, followed by a group Q&A session led by yours truly. Each company will have six and a half minutes, and I will appear on the screen with 15 seconds left to go. We do encourage you to do your due diligence, go to CEDAR, and connect with the companies directly in order to get detailed information. Contact details for the presenters can be found on our website, takestocklive.com, and Raj also puts them up at the end of the show today. Today we have Rob Cameron, CEO of Commander Resources, CMD, Mark Kolababa, President of Adamera Minerals, ADZ, and David Hotman, Chairman and CEO of Orstone Mining, ORS. Leading off, Rob Cameron, CEO of Commander Resources. Rob is a geologist with over 35 years of experience, including work with Dome Mines, Placer Dome, Phelps Dodge, and Freeport McMoran, as well as being a mining analyst for Research Capital. As CEO of Valley High Ventures, he was involved with the discovery of the Cordero Silver Deposit in Mexico, which was sold for $130 million. Rob, all yours. Well, thank you, uh, Mark, for the introduction, and uh, thanks, everyone, for attending the show. Uh, so today, um, this is our third presentation on Take Stock Live, and I'll be focusing mostly on some of the new developments within Commander, primarily our Ontario Gold Projects, which we uh, a program we initiated uh, at the beginning of last year, just prior to lockdown. We picked up some ground in Pickle Lake, and I'll be talking about developments on our first loon project in the Pickle Lake area, primarily. Let me just put my clock on so I don't get the hook. Okay, uh, forward-looking statements, of course, we're an exploration company. Everything I say is forward-looking pretty much. 
just a reminder, Commander is a prospect generator. So even though today I'm talking about some new properties in Ontario, we have a lot of working parts. We have a large project portfolio. We have three active joint ventures with our partners on other projects. We have a royalty portfolio that's significant. And uh, we uh, have a bunch of projects throughout Canada and Mexico. But today I'm going to focus on our new Ontario Gold Initiative. Uh, just a quick look at our capital structure uh, to set the stage. We're very tightly held, uh, tightly structured, 35 and a half million shares outstanding. Add in the options, our fully diluted numbers, only 38 million shares. Our cash position is healthy. We're sitting on around $900,000 cash in the treasury. Plus we have marketable securities for another $1 million of value. So about 1.9 million in cash and cash equivalent. Um, this is our project distribution map for Commander. So you can see we have a lot of assets. Uh, the red dots are actual uh, mineral title and projects. Uh, the white dots are the distribution of our royalty portfolio. You can see we're spread across Canada with a single gold asset in Mexico. Today, I'm going to focus mostly on our first loon property, which is the cluster of dots uh, within that cluster of dots in uh, Western Ontario, right in the middle of the map. And this is a new gold initiative that we launched uh, in uh, the beginning of uh, the year. Uh, just after the right of PDAC. Uh, just a reminder though, we do have three active programs funded by our joint venture partners. Uh, these are uh, joint ventures with uh, significant companies. Our Mount Polly area properties are being explored by Imperial Metals. We have a Porphy Copper Gold project in Northern BC being funded by Freeport Mac Moran. And we have a long lived joint venture with uh, Fjordland and HPX on our Voyages Bay Nickel uh, targets in Labrador. And these were all active to a certain extent this year, and there'll be some upcoming uh, uh, information on the state of these joint ventures here over the next uh, month or so. But back into our Ontario Gold projects. So here's uh, the project uh, district map here, classic Ontario geology, the greenstone belts in green here, obviously. Our first loon project in the Pick Lake Gold Camp is in what's the Uchi sub-province, which to the west hosts the uh, super large uh, Red Lake mining camp. Uh, I'll mention briefly, if we have time, some results from Sabin and the Staunton project and the Garden Lake project, two new ventures that we haven't talked about previously, uh, we'll probably not get into during this presentation. Results are pending. So this is our the land map in uh, Pickle Lake. Uh, our property is the red property uh, through the swath through the middle of the slide here. It doesn't look very large compared to our uh, neighbors, but that's 27 kilometer long mineral belt, uh, hopefully a deformation zone that we have staked there. Uh, the large orange property adjacent to us is an Australian company called Otico. Uh, and the, uh, the Mauve company at the bottom is another Australian company called Artiden. It's a vast land position that expands off to the west off the slide. Uh, you can see the mineral trends that are known in the uh, main property under Otico's uh, tenure here. Uh, and we have, we think, a parallel structure running through our red property here, which we call First Loon. Uh, this is probably a, one of Australia's prominent gold plays. It's all Australian juniors. And keep in mind, Red Lake is now owned by an Australian major as well. So it really is a, a new uh, uh, a new Australian gold play. And it gets a lot of attention in the Australian markets. We don't see that day to day here. Uh, this is the geology map. Once again, our property in red. You can see that we've uh, covered some of these sort of yellow swaths of Felsic volcanics and iron formations uh, with through the center of the property. But there's no outcrop. This geology map is almost fantasy in many respects drawn together from interpretation from magnetic maps. But once again, you can see the map, the trends, the ore trends from the uh, main Pickle Lake producers. Uh, total production here is 2.3 million ounce trend onto our property. And this northeastern quadrant, I think, is the most significant part of our property. And here it is. This is government mag and uh, EM. The conductors are the dots. Uh, the magnetics are obviously the color underlay. You can see the prominent iron formations are these extremely high red magnetic patterns in here. We've just completed an 800 line kilometer mag EM survey specifically over our property, much higher resolution than this government data, more modern system, high resolution Digim uh, EM survey to pick out structures. The whole goal of that is to complete the mag image over the Northeast quadrant, as well as to define structures to enable us to do a structural interpretation because these ore bodies in this kind of district are all hosted by structures often with our informations related to them, but not necessarily always. So we got uh, a lot of new information coming in high resolution that we hope to uh, uh, use to guide the work next year. Uh, it just wrapped up. We should get the results from that within the next month or so. 
this is what the terrain looks like. Uh, as you can see, it's going to be a challenge. There is no outcrop, less than 1% outcrop. Uh, it's till covered flat. Uh, there's no, ma uh, there's hardly any outcrop sticking out. It really is a remote type uh, exploration uh, program here. The geophysics to define geology, the geochemistry to define uh, uh, targets within the till. This is thick till cover. Uh, it's usually uh, best explored with a basal till sampling, looking for grains of gold as well as some geochemistry in the gold. And that is, uh, we've done an orientation survey waiting for those results and that technique once proven up will be what we'll probably follow up the targets we identify from the geophysical survey so it's a very laborious uh, systematic but uh, uh, challenging environment to work in but the prize is pretty good you can see the pickle lake the crow mine right here on the left hand side of this slide our property is in this flat on the right hand side and that was about a million ounces of a high grade gold otico just announced uh, their uh, uh, first resource of a million ounces of gold uh, just right in this area, right in here uh, in September. Uh, this is what some of the rocks look like. Uh, this is what few rocks we saw in this program we just completed here. Uh, but you can see some iron carbonate alteration, definitely some shearing. You can see, uh, you know, uh, quartz veining. You can see folded quartz veins, quite a prominent shear zone type of array here. We don't know if this runs or not. We have rocks taken, but uh, we'll see. And uh, that's pretty well it. I'll skip the seven. Uh, high grade gold uh, numbers uh, looks like uh, we could encounter here in uh, our seven project results to come uh, over the next month or so. So that's Commander. Very good. Thank you, Rob. And now, Mark Kolobaba, President at Amera Minerals. Mr. Mark Kolobaba has been instrumental in major dis discoveries in diamonds, gold, silver, and base metals. Having held positions with BHP Billiton, Kaminka Limited, the Northgate Group, Diamonds North, and Uranium North. Mr. Kolobaba was part of the team that discovered the first 120 kimberlites at the Akati Diamond Mine Project and was responsible for the initial discovery of the Hope Bay Gold Deposit in Nunavut. Mark? Thank you. Thanks, Mark. Okay, let's talk about Adamera. We have six and a half minutes. <clears throat> uh, Forward-looking statement. Okay, we're, we're focused 100% in Washington State, Northeast Washington State, and we're looking for high-grade gold. The reason we're doing this in this area, uh, Washington has, ha, has mined, in this area, this part of Washington, there's been 7 million ounces of gold mined, average grade of 14.5 grams per ton, so clearly high grade. You've got a community that's very supportive of mining, and there's currently a mill that's there in care and maintenance, so all very good infrastructure. Our projects are shown in the in the map to the right. You can see Cook Mountain, Flag Hill. I'll talk about those. Empire Creek. I won't say too much in this uh, in this presentation. And then off to the the northwest, something called Buckhorn 2.0 is a new project that we just uh, picked up recently. And we've all heard the saying: the best place to look for a mine is next to a mine. Well, that's a common theme for us in in every property that we've got. We're either adjacent to a past producer or very close to a past producer. Now let's take a look at that mill I mentioned. This is a 2000 ton per day mill. It's owned by Kinross. It's currently on care and maintenance. This mill has produced 3 million ounces of gold. And you can see the obelisk off to the, to the right, that photograph. That was a monument installed by Kinross. And you can see the last, basically what you're looking at there is all the different deposits that contributed to that, to that, uh, three million ounces of gold processed in that mill. And uh, the Buckhorn, our Buckhorn, uh, our project Buckhorn 2.0 surrounds that. K2 is close to our Empire Creek project. Lamefoot, Key, and Overlook, if you can read that, is associated with our Cook Mountain project. Now, if you're on Cook Mountain project, you can look down the hill and you can see the photograph to the right. That is the tailings pond, so you can see how close we are to the mill. Let's take a look further at Cook Mountain. Uh, Cook Mountain is an area that we've been working for a number of years. We've developed a lot of good targets here. In January of 2020, we signed an agreement with Hochschild. Uh, they can earn 60% interest by spending the next 8 million US dollars, and then an additional 15% by completing feasibility. So it's a very strong deal for, for us, and it's a good deal for them that, I think they were really attracted to the targets. We've got a very high, uh, caliber of targets here. We use a lot of different tools to develop those targets. And 
not only do we have a lot of targets, but we've done some drilling ourselves, and you can see we've had some very good results on these on these areas. These are some pretty decent intercepts. And just for example, the 2.3 grams per ton gold over four and a half meters at the top of that list, that is a single drill hole into an EM conductor that is 300 meters from the Key West pit. Now, that's not something you walk away from. That's where you go and you put another five or 10 holes into just to see if you've got higher grades and perhaps a lot of continuity, all right? So good set of grades that we've got here uh, in, that, in that district. One of the things we did this year, right on uh, shortly after signing that agreement uh, on Cook Mountain, we significantly uh, increased the size of that project. We staked that in conjunction with, with Hoschild. And later that summer, we've actually developed a target and we just announced a, a target on the ground with uh, rock samples up to 18.6 uh, grams per ton gold. That was just on, on Monday we announced that or Tuesday. One of our big pushes this year was to complete deep penetrating IP over the project, over Overlook, Goodfoot, and Lamefoot South parts of the project. That data has been coming in and the survey is finally being completed today or tomorrow. And that the important thing is that data is now being shipped to a geophysicist. It's being inverted and modeled. And we're going to be using that as a major uh, key data set to develop a definitive drill list for the partnership. And for, that's for an upcoming drill program. You know, I talked about our partnership, but we also have projects on our own. We own a lot of the, a, a number of projects, 100%. Here's one that we staked fairly recently. This is what we call Buckhorn 2.0. So it's about, it's about 80 kilometers from the mill. It's a large piece of ground, it's 37 kilometers, and it surrounds the Buckhorn mine. This is, take a look at that, 1.3 million ounces of gold, average grade, 12 grams per ton. So when that was in production, that was the highest grade producing mine in the USA. The central photograph, you can see one of our targets, we're looking down and we can see the Buckhorn mine. That's, that's how close we are to that mine. Okay, uh, this year, what did we do in the project? Well, we, we staked that in June. That was shortly after, after the uh, work restrictions were lifted due to COVID. Uh, we completed a geological map, and that's really used to help us focus in on areas that we need to do more detailed work. We've identified a few areas. We're, going, we're about to start later this week doing detailed soil, detail, detailed brown magnetic surveys. Now, I've put this map off to the right. I've never shown this before, but this is basically what we staked, and it's also basically what land Kinross held while they were mining the buckhorn. The red dots that you see are targets that Kinross developed but never had a chance to drill before they dropped those claims. So when they dropped the claims shortly after we picked that up, what we're doing now, since we don't have a lot of data yet, we're essentially going out and doing surveys over those dots. Those are their drill targets. We're going to try to re, uh, basically re-engineer targets out of that. And it'll be a very good data set, very detailed mag and soils. Another project is, uh, Flag Hill, I won't talk about this because I think I'm running out of time here. Now, we've made some major changes to our board over the year, over the last year. These are big changes or more like additions. Uh, and it just tells you how important we think Buckhorn is. Mark Jones was the original, is with Crown, who discovered the Buckhorn deposit back in the 70s. And Peter Cooper was with Crown and also Kinross for a number of years. And he knows that property better than anybody. So they bring a lot to the table. And in summary, uh, we like the high grade nature of this area. Our targets are really well developed. We use a lot of different tools to de-risk them. And we're big believers in partnerships and also 100% ownership. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. And our third presenter today, David Hotman, Chairman and CEO or Stone Mining. Mr. Hotman brings 30 years of experience in corporate finance and management of junior resource companies. Mr. Hotman is also a founding team member of Eldorado Gold which, on the TSX and the NYSE and Nevada Pacific Gold, which was on the TSX, which was acquired by McEwen Mining in 2007. David, you're on. Thank you very much. Um, I appreciate everybody taking the time to watch this presentation on uh, Orstone. And 
as the other presenters have mentioned, it's a six minute format or six and a half minutes. So I would encourage everybody to uh, go to our website and or find other sources of uh, uh, due diligence material. Uh, the management of Orstone has international experience. We've been involved in the early stage to scoping study level of uh, five different projects and, and been involved in either op, uh, building and operating uh, uh, approximately 10 different uh, mining operations. Uh, some of the, the projects are, have been uh, quite large scale. The company has a, a low market capitalization and gives you exposure to both copper and to gold, primarily in British Columbia, uh, as that is our, our primary asset right now. Uh, the area that we're located in British Columbia is in the Quinell Trough, which has a, a whole series of mines, some of them uh, world class. Um, just to the north of us is the Mount Milligan Copper Gold Mine. And just to the southeast of us, uh, or southwest of us, is the uh, about 10 million ounce uh, uh, Blackwater Gold Deposit that um, is uh, in early stages of uh, feasibility. Uh, so basically, our captain project is 26 square miles in size. Um, it covers a, a cluster of uh, mag targets uh, with coincident IP. Uh, we've drilled a couple of those targets and uh, are, are planning to do further drilling this year. The project has uh, uh, very good logistics. There's a whole series of um, uh, logging roads and uh, forest service roads that give us access to all of the, the targets. Um, the graphic that you see on the screen right now are the 10 targets that we've outlined or 10 primary targets that we've outlined in red. Uh, some of them are, are quite large uh, on the lower right hand side of, excuse me, lower left hand side of the screen. Uh, our T9 target is three kilometers by one kilometer in size and uh, has the potential to, to host, uh, so to speak, several Mount Milligan sized deposits. Um, Basically, the uh, uh, target that you see, just a second here. Uh, I don't know if everybody can see that on the screen, uh, but basically that target that uh, I just outlined that's in the circle there um, is the, the two targets basically that we have drilled. Uh, we've got long intercepts of mineralization, copper, gold mineralization. And it's worth noting that every place on the property that we have drilled uh, has a higher ratio of gold to copper. Uh, what would a mining company presentation be without a picture of a rock? Uh, this is in the core of that uh, previous target that I mentioned. It's approximately, uh, well, it is uh, 0.9 grams per ton gold uh, with 0.2% copper. It's a um, um, uh, breccia format and um, we believe that we figured out the exploration model for the the project uh, moving forward this is that uh, t9 target uh, which is on the lower left hand side of the uh, the screen uh, we're going to be drilling this anomaly um, uh, starting here in about a month uh, you can see the mag profile at the bottom of the screen with the proposed drill hole uh, and so basically in in summary on the the project it's a project that is uh, a cluster of uh, porphyry targets, um, uh, gold rich. Every place that we've uh, encountered mineralization, it's a, it's a gold rich system. And so this November, uh, within the next 30 days, uh, we're gonna be drilling two to four core holes uh, and that'll test two different targets. Um, and um, Basically, that is all on the, the, the target. I think I actually might uh, come in under my time today. Uh, the last graphic here is on the, the capital structure. Uh, we've got, we do have a bit of an overhang of, of warrants, as you can see, but if they were exercised, we'd have approximately 3 million um, Canadian in the bank. Um, and our market capitalization is $2.5 million Canadian. Uh, with a big porphyry discovery, there's no reason it couldn't be 50 or $100 million Canadian. Uh, so there's certainly potential for investors to come along for the ride and uh, um, uh, participate with us as we uh, build value for shareholders. And with that, uh, one minute early, I will 
uh, succeed the floor and uh, open it up to questions. Actually, a minute and a half early, David. You were most efficient. So uh, thank you for that. And uh, let's bring back our other presenters for the Q&A. Good, Rob and Mark. So my first question, uh, and David pretty much covered, uh, commented that his next phase of exploration is covered, the two to four holes, the financing is covered, but uh, you may have another phase after that. So could each of you, and let's go uh, David, Rob and Mark, talk about uh, this, the budget that you have and your whether or not it's funded at the current time. Uh, we currently have approximately half million uh, in, in the bank and receivables. Uh, the program we're looking at drilling is uh, 150 to 300,000. Uh, we have some uh, uh, very large and, and supportive shareholders and uh, uh, raising additional funds uh, uh, we don't view as uh, being difficult. Uh, but the current program is is covered with funds in the uh, in the treasury right now. All right, for uh, Commander, um, it's the program still being developed going forward. Uh, we're not at the drill stage yet, so we're, next year's program on first loon anyway will be uh, involve a bunch of uh, till geochemistry. A uh, bunch of our other projects will be active and draw on our treasury as well. But we have nine hundred thousand dollars in cash. We have a million dollars in marketable securities. And uh, so for 1.9 million, we're pretty well covered for any needs next year. And we're uh, one of our other assets is a cash flowing royalty, which should start performing for us in 18 months on the uh, hammer down mine uh, with Maritime. So uh, we're quite comfortable uh, going forward with uh, what we foresee uh, in the future here. And for us, <clears throat> we've got a number of projects. Uh, the partnership, we're looking at about a 5,000 meter drill program. Before we get to that, we've got to go through all of our new IP targets and, and, and generate and make a definitive list for the for the program. So Hochschild will be funding that and we hope we're hope they're hoping to have that drill program completed entirely before April of next year. So uh, on our our own ground, we're still developing targets and we are we'll be going through the permitting process on that. We've begun that, but it's it just takes a little bit more uh, time with a brand new project. We need targets before we can get permits. So probably uh, we're looking at maybe mid mid year next year for some of these other projects. So the funding for for those, are you do you have in the till or do you have? To have yeah, we we've got about seven hundred thousand uh, dollars in our in our own right. Uh, Hochschild is absolutely funded for that, and we don't see it as well uh, difficulty raising additional funds if we have more targets to drill on our hundred percent own ground. Okay, good. So now I'm, someone has left their mic on. If you can pick off. Good. Um, so when it comes time to budget, when it's budget time, you have a whole bunch of things you'd love to do. And there are a couple of things that are, a couple of targets that are really good, places you'd like to do geophysics, a couple of targets you'd like to drill, and they just don't make it on for this year. Could each of you give a couple of examples of work that did not make the cut, but might make the cut next year. Let's go with uh, Rob and Mark, and then David. That's a tough question, Mark, thanks. Um, <laughs> well, it's a hard one to answer for Commander because as a project generator, we have about a dozen projects uh, that we're always continuously upgrading and working on. And our business model isn't so much to advance them ourselves, uh, but to find partners to advance them. So it's an exercise we always uh, are working towards and it's uh, unpredictable when you actually identify that partner and then you launch the project in their hands and do that heavy lifting. Uh, but uh, this year we uh, we were uh, sparing with our work activities. We focused on Ontario and uh, we did minimal programs on some of our BC projects. Uh, I would have liked to have done more, but I think in these times it was uh, more uh, uh, worthwhile to build out our gold portfolio and focus on Ontario. But I would have worked more on our BC projects. We did do minimum programs with some success, and we'll be talking about that shortly, but uh, I would have done a little more aggressive programs uh, in better times, COVID-wise. Financially, it's a great year for the market. Yeah, for us, uh, it's really, uh, there, were, there were a number of factors. We're, we ran four months behind, so really it wasn't that we had data over projects that we didn't know if they made the grade or not. It was really a matter of just getting the work done. And 
So COVID was a, a really late state for us, a start for us. Then later we had fire restrictions and we certainly got what we set out to get done in terms of IP, but we would have liked to have done a lot more exploration on other projects. And that's, you know, that that's just what you can do in these kinds of years. So we had the funding, but not the time. And, and now we're getting hit with a, a slightly earlier winter, but I think we'll still get a lot of that work done. Uh, we'll work right until we, we can't, essentially. Uh, as far as Orstone, um, uh, basically uh, we have uh, 10 different targets identified. Um, all of the work is uh, complete prior to drilling. Uh, so things that we are items that, that we didn't get to this year that we'd like to have uh, another 10 or 20 drill holes to uh, make the discovery. And on the same targets or some of the other? I mean, how many of the 10 targets are you drilling this time? And then? Uh, well, we've drilled uh, uh, two to date, and, and we believe that we've figured out, figured out the exploration model and what's driving mineralization. Uh, we're going to be drilling uh, uh, the next two targets, uh, which are quite a bit larger um, this November. So it would have been nice to, to have uh, 10 holes. Um, but then again, uh, 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 until you have a discovery, it's called exploration. And so um, uh, every time you drill, you get further information. Uh, we believe we've figured it out, uh, but you don't know until you get the assays. Very good. So let's, you've mentioned the, the model. So let's, uh, and on this question, let's go Mark, David and, and Rob. Tell us a little more about your deposit model. And Mark, in your case, uh, talk of, Speak to the uh, project, uh, your Buckhorn 2.0, and uh, tell us more about your deposit models. Yeah, at, at Buckhorn, the Buckhorn deposit is thought to be a precious metal scar. And, you know, that's what we target. But I think there's more to it than that because the, the deposit is right along the margin of a grobin. And these grobins are super highways for fluids. And it seems like all of the deposits in that district are within say 500 meters or 700 meters of that grobin structure. So I, I think there's, you know, we're not 100% clear on the model, uh, I, but I do think that the SCARN is important because it's a good host for gold. And if you get the right fluids, those fluids can basically upgrade your, your gold content. So, you know, the, the, the SCARN might have one or two grams, but if you can get that upgrading of fluids, uh, you know, you get into the 10 gram plus, 15 gram types of... Uh, deposits and that's really what we're looking for. I don't remember who was next. You you are David. Good. Okay. Um so basically we've got uh these this series of targets uh uh are uh, outlined um by coincident uh, maglow features. And so it seems that in between these mag low features, we have mag highs with coincident IP. Um, there's uh, enough overburden that, um, uh, that there are no exposures on surface. So it's prospecting by drilling. And uh, the um, drilling last year across one of these uh, mag highs uh, gave us a substantial amount of uh, uh, breccia and, and alteration, basically uh, intrusive material. Uh, so the, the Basically, these are, are feeder structures is the interpretation. And um, uh, on the edges of it, uh, we have uh, six to nine grams uh, gold. Uh, but of course, that's not the exploration model. It's a, it's a large bulk tonnage uh, deposit. Uh, and so basically, um, uh, monzonite porphyries, um, which is typical in the, um, uh, in the Quinell trough. And... Um, so a, a, just a basically a porphyry model. That's it. Uh, with respect to our first loom property, we're Ontario uh, gold country. So the, you know, gold in Ontario and Quebec is prominently orogenic gold, which means they're shear zone related, structurally controlled, quartz vein dominated systems. Uh, in detail, each deposit is incredibly complex, both geometry and alteration and host rocks. Uh, in the Pick Lake camp, everyone's chased iron formations. A number of reasons for this is uh, iron formations are easily traced with uh, magnetics. Uh, there's no outcrop, so you got to go with something. And 
our information is also great hosts because they're nice brittle rocks and they sustain open space uh, quartz veining and which hosts all these gold deposits. So that's the main uh, ore model for the Pickle Lake camp. But there's a million other uh, variations on the ore deposit uh, structural theme that uh, could host gold in other environments. Everyone focus on iron formations because they're easy. Other environments have not been tested. There's a lot of opportunity uh, to test uh, variations on the theme in this camp. Very good. And staying in a similar vein, but turning to the geophysics, uh, for the non-geologists, uh, can each of you explain your choice to use induced polarization, IP, instead of electromagnetic? I mean, we, we get it. Most of us non-geologists understand about mag, but take us a little deeper into your your choice of particular electromagnetic, electromag survey or, or induced polarization. And David, let's start with you and then Rob and Mark. Your mic isn't on, David. Thank and, you. and before Thank you start, also tell us about the expense, because I believe one is more expensive than the other and so on. Thank you. Yeah, uh, to date, um, because we have um, uh, 20 to 80 meters of overburden on the, the captain project, um, uh, we've uh, we started out with an initial uh, uh, IP uh, hit on some uh, original logging roads, uh, and so we have uh, we've done uh, a substantial amount of of IP, um, and those numbers are not in the presentation, uh, but I believe it's a uh, 144 linear uh, kilometers of mag. And so what we're looking for are um, uh, rocks with metal in them, basically. And um, that is, um, in terms of cost, it is a lot cheaper to do mag than IP. Uh, and it just happens that, um, um, that our mag targets are, are showing up as, as the, uh, the primary driver or, or targeting model. And we have uh, all the mag coverage and and uh, ip coverage that that we need to to move forward and and uh, drill the targets okay at uh, at first loon uh, we went with uh, a helicopter based uh, mag em system uh, with no outcrop you have to start with geophysics uh, the area has no road access a lot of swamps cover and a little outcrop uh, because we're looking for structure structure shows up nice with an em survey which really measures conductivities. So uh, you could do a, a sort of pseudo geology map based on your apparent resistivities and you could find discrete conductors as well. Uh, although the mark, uh, the target really is not a discrete conductor. They're, uh, uh, they're uh, more resistive uh, things, but uh, the mag maps the geology, the EM maps the structure, combine the two and you could put a pseudo geology target map together and then you have to fine tune it with other geophysics. Ultimately, we probably will migrate into induced polarization ground surveys to find uh, sulfide rich uh, enclaves within that larger uh, EM uh, target. So it's a, an iterative process for us, but we have to start with EM in our particular deposit model. Oops. Yeah, we're not that different. Uh, I mean, we, we don't rely on one. We use mag to find the magnetite. We use EM to find massive sulfides, and we use e, uh, IP for the disseminated and for the silica-rich environments. So we we like mag because it's so cheap, and we have all of our own equipment, so we can do a lot of it. We we tend to rely a lot on airborne EM, so like a VTEM type survey, and IP. It's quite inexpensive for us as well because we have our own equipment and our and we train local people to work those surveys. So we do a lot of IP and a lot of ground mag. And we, and we work all of those together along with geochemistry to really build our targets. Very good. Uh, so let's now talk a little bit about community relations and uh, who, who, are you, who are the, commu the local community that you uh, have to collaborate with or work with or have uh, permission from? And uh, how have you found the communications? So let's go with Rob, then Mark, then David. Okay, uh, in, in Pickle Lake is a small uh, community uh, with uh, several indigenous communities uh, nearby. Uh, it's sort of the end of the road uh, community and it's a staging ground for a lot of farther 
north uh, communities as well. Uh, it's an early stage project. We've only just acquired the ground and done uh, sort of non-invasive uh, uh, surface work. So we haven't begun yet our uh, negotiations or communications with the local First Nations, but that will be a dominant exercise through the winter months going forward. Uh, it is a mining friendly district in the sense that uh, everyone's aware of mining, the impacts of mining positively and negatively, I guess. Uh, the major partners or neighborhood uh, with the other companies that are working there have uh, engaged them dramatically. So there's good relationship with those. Everyone has to make their own relationship, but at least they're aware of what uh, the impact of uh, uh, these negotiations look like. And uh, they're, you know, self-aware of what uh, mining is all about. So there's a easy process to start the communications and then it's all about building trust, but we haven't done that yet. It's our next step. Uh, working in the USA, uh, the First Nation issues are quite different. And the land is quite a bit more uh, settled. And, you know, there's there's a little bit when you're permitting, but not 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 that much. The community where, where, where we work is really quite involved in mining. It's a mining town. Uh, the jobs that they, it's either forestry or mining. And forestry is really not doing well, and, and they like mining. So mining has been really supported by the communities in in. Washington state and, and not all of Washington. I'm speaking about Northeast Washington uh, or North Central Washington. It's really a mining friendly district and you can get permits done in fairly reasonable time. Um, in our area of British Columbia, we have uh, primarily one uh, First Nations band, uh, which is the Nakasli band. And uh, we've been in consultation with them for quite a number of years and um, uh, uh, continue to employ um, members of the band uh, during our exploration programs. Uh, it's very early stage, there's no ore body developed and uh, uh, as we get more serious uh, in terms of a discovery and drilling something off uh, and pre-development, then of course uh, we, would, we would need to have further consultation. But, uh, um, uh, our relationship is good with them, and uh, uh, so far, no difficulties whatsoever. Good. And while you're there, David, um, two questions for you from the chat board. Um, first of all, I, you know, some some drilling has been delayed in southern British Columbia due to the sudden uh, and heavy snow. Uh, you're a little further north. Uh, will your drilling be delayed because of weather? Uh, no, in fact, we're delayed right now waiting for freeze up. Um, we've uh, drilled most of our programs in the winter time. Um, it uh, adds incrementally only to uh, to our costs. Uh, I didn't mention, but I should. Uh, we're uh, on the main road, supply road that goes from Fort St. James to um, the Mount Milligan mine. Uh, all of the, the logging roads infrastructure in the area that we're in uh, our year-round roads. Um, water is uh, uh, fairly close by, uh, so we don't have any concerns weather-wise. It's not mountainous terrain. It's a, it's um, a pretty much flat. It's a plateau, and uh, most of it has been clear-cut because of the pine beetle infestations over the last uh, decade or so. Uh, so it's weather is not an issue for us whatsoever. No, granted, I'll be sitting in a nice warm office in Vancouver. Right. Um, yeah. Regardless, you don't want minus 40 to freeze your hoses. That's um, right. Yeah. Um, the Orstone Chili Copper Project, how is it going? Will it be drilled in the future? Drilled in um, we did a, a, a round of drilling over the summer. Um, the results were mixed to um, disappointing. Uh, in fact, let's see. Uh, one of the, or the, the, the big target that we drilled was remarkably unmineralized. And so, um, uh, we probably won't be, um, spending any, uh, large dollars on that project in the near future. Okay, good. And I'd mentioned to the audience, if you'd like to come on and ask a question, raise your hand, Raj will figure out the logistics for that. <laughs> That's right. You'll find that on the right hand side, you'll find your ability to uh, raise your hand uh, and, and ask a question. So let's uh, similar question for Rob and Mark. Uh, are there any other projects that you'd like to tell us about uh, that you didn't touch on? 
I'll, I'll go first there. Um, yeah, there's a set, we've worked on a lot of fronts. Um, we did a bit of work on our uh, burn copper project with Freeport MacMoran, and uh, so we'll have some updates on that one coming out uh, shortly. Uh, our, our main asset really driving investor interest, uh, our dominant asset is our uh, exposure to the, through our royalty to the Hammerdown project with Maritime. And that continues to advance uh, positively. Uh, Maritime has had an aggressive drill program there. Great marketing campaign. There's a lot of uh, new awareness and eyes on that project uh, and indirectly to us because we have the royalty. And last month we announced that the Maritime had uh, exercised the right to buy down the royalty and we put $750,000 in cash into our treasury through that early exercise of the royalty uh, last month. So uh, that's part of the reasons why we're so uh, healthy financially. And uh, it's progressing properly and uh, uh, hopefully we'll see that thing bear fruit in 18 months and we'll start cash flowing from that asset. So uh, that's really uh, one of the main cores of uh, commanders at royalty exposure. For, for us, the other project, it, I mean, we're 100% focused in Washington state. And one of the other projects that we've got that we like a lot is called Flag Hill. Flag Hill is on the Southern extension of the Republic district. The Republic District has produced about 4 million ounces with an average grade of 20 grams per ton. So we've got this uh, portion of ground on the Southern Extension. It has two drill holes in it from 1950 and 1972. And we've got targets built up and it's something we wanna drill as soon as we can. And, and we've, we've, got, we've got permits on that and it's just something that we can get out and, and do well, probably next year we're hoping. Good. Well, we'll take one more question from the chat board. We, I don't think anyone has raised their hand yet, but you still have time. Uh, can each of you speak briefly on the percentage of shares held by management? That comes from uh, Greg Ha on the chat board. So let's go um, Mark, David, and Rob. Yeah, uh, about we've probably got about 20, so I guess about 20% held by management, maybe a little bit more than that. Um, a fairly decent portion. Go ahead. Uh, we we have uh, uh, fifteen to twenty percent held by management, um, in very friendly hands. Uh, we have another uh, thirty plus percent uh, of the company, uh, so it's it, it's fairly tightly held. Uh, Commander is a uh, has a l much lower percentage. Uh, we're sitting around four to five percent the management ownership of the company. Uh, uh, the company has been around for thirty years, and management is not around at found forming of the company. So a lot of that is uh, shares that are acquired in the marketplace is uh, how I like to characterize that. And management has been uh, accumulating over the last uh, month or so. Okay. Um, there was one additional question. You seem to be popular, David. Uh, Michael Gentile, Gentile just filed on SEDI the sale of 3.875 million shares. This comes from James Quantes. Was he only interested in Resguardo? Uh, that was uh, the, the primary focus. Um, a big target and uh, lots of potential. Um, the captain project is is equally exciting, and uh, uh, we're in contact with uh, uh, with Michael on a continuous basis. So um, uh, we'll uh, uh, hope to uh, uh, keep his interest peaked. Very good. So here's the last question for each of you, and uh, let, let's go, Rob, Mark, and David. I I think it in some some for some of you it may be a pretty obvious answer, but uh, other than convincing investors to buy your shares and being more effective at it than all of the other 1,400 odd public juniors that are out there. Uh, tell us what investors should look for, what milestone, what event should they next be looking for uh, from you? Okay, for Commander, uh, it, because we're a prospect generator, we have so many moving parts, it's sort of steady news flow. So you'll have updates from results going forward. Hopefully we'll be able to get some joint venture partners added to our current three uh, and also uh, advancements uh, at the Hammerdown project via Maritime. So indirectly we benefit from that uh, milestone. So it's really a, a steady stream of uh, incremental news going forward. And uh, you know some of the results could be profound, but we have to wait for them to show up. Uh, so it's, uh, it's classic expiration. <laughs> Well, for us, it's pretty, um, pretty, pretty simple. On our oversight or Cook Mountain project, we spent a lot of time developing targets there. 
Uh, the best thing we can do now is drill them. We've done everything we can do. The targets are just getting a little bit more defined, but getting out and drilling is a big thing. I'm really happy about our new project, the uh, Buckhorn. Buckhorn is one really rich deposit. It's by itself, and these things typically don't occur by themselves. So we're quite confident we're going to see more. And having this land package come together, I, you start to, you know, normally you're looking for a deposit, and I start to feel like we have a shot at having more than one deposit, and that's a big driver for us on that. Uh, for Orstone, uh, the future is uh, drilling on our captain project. We'll be drilling several big targets, as I mentioned, next month. In addition to that, uh, we're looking at several different acquisitions that we're quite excited about, uh, both uh, uh, large target potential as well as a couple of resource um, uh, resource projects that we could move towards production. Very good. Thank you to you, our presenters. May you have success in your exploration. Rob Cameron, Commander Resources, CMD, Mark Kolababa, Adamera Minerals, ADZ, and David Hotman, Orstone Mining, ORS. I'd also like to do a special shout out to Meg, which supports us. I, it's autumn now, and I am back to wearing your vest when we're on, so thank you for keeping me dressed and warm, Calgary Mineral Exploration Group. And uh, to you, our attendees, Thank you for your time today. Do go to today's company's websites, learn more about them, and check in at takestocklive.com. Be determined in your due diligence and ask tough questions. We'll be back with the last session, the ultimate session of this season, next Wednesday, the 28th of October, with Integra and Forbidden Spirits. This is Mark and Raj signing out from Take Stock Live. Thank you. Thanks, everybody.